Hey everyone, so good to see you guys. Hey, if you have a Bible this morning, grab it. If you have your phone, go on YouVersion app or whatever you use. We're in Acts chapter 18. We've been traveling through the book of Acts, which is like the 30 year history of the early church and seeing like how they lived and how they followed Jesus and different um, experiences that they had that can um, be informative for us as we learn to follow Jesus in the moment that we're living through. So we are in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18 today, um, when you get there, say amen. Acts 18. Amen. Amen. Jesus, thank you so much for uh, the ability to be here today on this beautiful day in the city of Davis, in the center of the city, God, where we can be an expression of hope and life and healing and redemption through Jesus. I pray, Lord, for every person here today that you would speak to their hearts. And I pray that you would speak to us as a church community as we begin the fall season of 2020 in such an unprecedented year. Would you do a work that no person could explain apart from you through us? We love you, we praise you, we worship you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Acts chapter 18, I thought, hey, we should just jump into this today. And uh, to jump into a brand new chapter in a huge book, uh, let me give you some context of what's taking place in Acts chapter 18. Paul has just left Athens which is a cultural hub of creativity and learning um, in the Mediterranean world. And at this point in the first century, this was the Roman Empire. And he travels 50 miles to a city called Corinth. And in Corinth, uh, what was formed there, the team that was formed, the work that was done, what God did was incredible. And and a lot of people... um, you know, they think about these travels in the book of Acts and they're like, you know, did Paul just kind of like Jesus, like one night say, hey, you know, I'm going to text you or I'm going to phone, phone a friend and say, hey, you know, I want you to go to this city next or I want you to go to this city next. Well, I like to tell people when you read through the book of Acts, Paul was, yes, led by the spirit, but two, he was really strategic. You see, Athens was a leading city in the Roman Empire and so was Corinth. Corinth was a place of influence. Uh, Here's a little bit about the city of Corinth that you probably didn't want to know, but I'll let you know anyways. The city of Corinth was a harbor city, so commerce came in and out of this city. So people were always traveling from other places in the Roman Empire to Corinth. So Paul knew if if he planted a church and preached the gospel in Corinth, that whoever came there and left there would take the gospel with them. So he... He went to this harbor city, was also an urban center. Don't think of Davis, maybe like Los Angeles, right? Or San Francisco. It was a city full of life and culture um, and urban center. I'm not saying that Davis isn't like that. I'm just saying it's not like a massive city. Um, And so think of maybe San Francisco. That's close to us. This was a major multicultural urban center in the Roman Empire. It was also a very diverse city, full of different socioeconomic socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, ethnicities. It was super diverse, and uh, it had a diverse population. At this point, some scholars think between 100 and 200,000 people, which was a very large city in the ancient world. Uh, Corinth also had a diversity of religions. So when you came to Corinth, it was a very religious place. So Paul knew that he was entering a city to preach the gospel that was very open to different beliefs and religions. And it was also associated with its immorality. It was one of the most immoral cities in ancient history. Um, It was known for its prostitution and, and cult worship where they would have very, very not good things. I won't say it because there's kids in here. So, um, but it, it was definitely not a great place. It was a very immoral city. And one of the problems with Corinth that we see later on in the book of First Corinthians is that it was a very individualistic city and competitive. People were like, I want to get a higher GPA than you. 
I, I want to have more money than you. I want to be more well known in society than you. I want to be better than you was like the ethos of the city of Corinth. So everybody was competing. And that took place in the church. That ethos, that mindset uh, invaded the church in Corinth. And so everybody began to compete spiritually, to climb the ladder, to compete with who had the best gifts, who was better at whatever gift in the church was being used. And, and it caused a lot of problems and division in the church. And I just got to throw this out here for you ancient fans of sports. This was also a sports city. This was a sports city. And uh, I love this because I'm a huge sports fan. Go LA Lakers, they're up 2-0. I know all of you do not care and you're not gonna root for me. In fact, you won't even listen to me from here on out, but that's okay, I'm a huge LA Lakers fan. This was a major sports city. It was a cultural hub. So Paul was super strategic when he went to this city to preach the gospel because he knew it would have an influence throughout the entire province, region, and Roman Empire. Now, a few lessons we learned from this story in Acts chapter 18. Here it is. Write it down if you're a note taker. We need a team to impact a city and a region. Paul didn't do this on his own. Paul didn't just, you know, he came to the city, but he didn't form Christianity on his own in the city. Uh, Acts chapter 18 paints a picture of all of these individuals coming together around the mission and person of Jesus to impact a city and eventually a region. You need a team. You see, teams have a greater probability for effectiveness and success than a single person. So when it comes to like impacting a city, or impacting a region, it takes a collective group of individuals, a squad, whatever you wanna call it, a family of Jesus followers coming together to say, hey, we're gonna invest in our circle of influence. We're gonna invest in our relationships. We're gonna invest where God has given us a platform to be on mission for Jesus. And maybe this is a prophetic word for some of you, and maybe you don't even know what a prophetic word is, but maybe God is saying, to you, I want to use your life in 2020 to bring hope and life and light to the city of Davis, to the campus at UC Davis more than ever before. And you're going to be a part of a team, a collective group of Jesus followers that, that is far more effective together than just alone. And we are going to see this city bring revival and hope through the message and person of Jesus in 2020 and 2021. Amen? Amen. One per Will, Will's the only one clapping. Will's like, yes, yes, Will. Will, you're, the, you're a legend. Uh, we're so blessed to have you in this city. We love you. So here's the question in Acts chapter 18. What does a healthy team look like? What does it look like to make a difference and to see a city impacted and changed through a collective group of individuals Three things for you. Number one, number one, what does a healthy team look like? Write this down. More than one all-star. More than one all-star. Look at verses one through three and then verses 24 through 26. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. You guys already got the background of that. Then he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Just a basic history. Uh, the Jewish people were kicked out of Rome by Claudius. Um, and so this is what's happening here. Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. So they had the same vocation, they could relate. That was his connection point. Then look at verses 24 through 26. At the end of this chapter, we learn of somebody else. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria came to Ephesus. He was a learned man, super smart and intelligent like all of you who go to UC Davis, with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. Though he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and Aquila uh, heard him, they invited him to their home and explained him the way of God more adequately. They're like, hey, we know some things you don't, so let us help you so that you could be more effective. Verse 27, 
When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was, great, he was a great help to those who by the grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in the public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. All of this took place in Corinth. So basically what he says from the beginning of the chapter to the end of the chapter was that Paul planted the church in Corinth. He was the one who started it. He planted it around A.D. Um, 49 through 51. He goes to the city of Corinth. He plants in this cultural hub of influence. And then he stayed there for a year and a half. And he taught the way of Jesus. That's what it was called in the early church. It wasn't called Christianity. It was called the way of Jesus because it was a way of life. It was following Jesus on this path and this way of life. So he teaches the way of Jesus. He disciples all the people there. And then he leaves for Ephesus. Ephesus is around 200 miles away. He leaves for Ephesus. And then when he leaves, Apollos stands up and he says, I'll pastor the church now. So Apollos, who was this incredible orator, he, he, he was an, a, just an exceptional communicator. He began to teach and pastor this church post Paul. L let me tell you about these two all-stars. Paul wrote most of the New Testament, half the New Testament. So it's the majority. He was known as the LeBron James of theology in the first century. He was like the man. He was brilliant. Apollos was also famous because he was one of the best communicators in the first century early church. So these guys were absolute all-stars. And here's the thing about effectiveness. You need more than one person. You need all kinds of talented, gifted people to carry out the message of Jesus and the work of Jesus in a community to make a difference. It's like Shaq had Kobe, Jordan had Pippen, and LeBron has AD. Thank you, at least someone knows in here. You have to have a team because a team has greater influence. Now you might say, well, okay, what is a what does a great team look like? What does a healthy team look like full of individuals who are gifted in their area according to God? Well, hey, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to pick up at verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Paul writes this. He says there are different kinds of gifts, right? We all have different gifts. But the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Same spirit, same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. If you like to take notes, write this down. Paul is saying there is diversity of gifts, but there is unity around God. We're all different. We have different experiences, different gifts, different degrees, different places of study, but, but guess what? We all have in common the same spirit, the same father, the same Messiah, Jesus Christ. We're all followers of Jesus. So there's diversity and unity. I'm going to go back to the sports illustration because I'm just like digging sports right now. So on a basketball team, you have five different players. And on the court, those five players make up five different positions. So you have like a point guard who passes the ball, gets assists. You've got a shooting guard who shoots the ball. I was a shooting guard uh, through college and I was like the black hole. You gave me the ball, I was gonna throw it up. Uh, you've got a shooting guard, you've got a small forward, a power forward, a center, that's defense, rebounding, dunking. Um, and every person on that team has a different skill set. But the great teams, each of those skill sets come together for the good and success of the team and they Although they're different, they unite around one goal to win a championship. And that's what, that's what a good team is like. There's diversity, right? And it's okay to be different. It's okay to have unique skill sets and experiences in different places on the team. But we all come together for the same Jesus and the same mission around Jesus. Notice what he says next, verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith to the same Spirit. 
to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. You're like, what's that? It's okay. We can talk about that later. All these are at work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Verse 12. Just as a body through one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free. And we were all given the same spirit to drink. Metaphorical language. We all share in the spirit of God. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So what's his point? Diversity, unity, variety. Again, he's, he's focusing on this. Variety of gifts, same God. Like sometimes we're so focused on a team of like, this is what I do and this is what you do. We have silos on teams. We're like sports teams get like this. Workplaces get like this. It's like, oh, this is our team. We're a team within a team and we're better and all we care about is our own success. That's not healthy. So God is driving home the point No silos in the kingdom of God. No solo uh, teammates in the kingdom of God. We are all together even though we are super diverse. Diversity is a part of God's imprint and creation. And so you have here in, in this book, in the book of Acts, you have Paul. Paul who was spreading the good news of Jesus throughout the Roman Empire. He was planting churches he was preaching the gospel he was teaching about the way of jesus from the old testament and then you have luke the writer of the book two different guy uh, gifts one guy was sharing the message verbally and communicatively and another person was writing down the story luke the doctor the physician writing down the story and, and causing there to be a raising of funds so that this story could be written down for all of church history and all of human history until Jesus comes back. We get to read this story. Same God, variety of gifts, same mission. That's what makes a great team. Amen? And here's the thing. I've done this story, this study for you so you don't have to do it on your own, but let me just tell you the main points of an effective teammate according to 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 all about the gifts we use and the diversity on our team as followers of Jesus. So basically Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, here's what makes a unified team. Here's what makes an effective team around the mission of Jesus, a local church. So he says five things. You ready for these? You want to know what an effective teammate and team looks like around Jesus? Here it is. First of all, big picture thought. Every person is responsible for the health of the whole. Every single person is responsible for the health of the whole. That means like if one person is like, you know, uh, negative, if one person is divisive, if one person is undermining the team, that person is a responsible party for the unhealth on that team and that unhealth could spread. But if one person is encouraging, they're all in, they're using their gift, they're worshiping Jesus, they're helping others to thrive and flourish, that person is responsible for the health of the team. So every single person is responsible for the health of the whole. Think about that. Think about that in your workplace. Think about that uh, in, in the church. Think about that in your community every person matters. That's why it's important to be like, hey, you know, in the workplace, hey, homie, like, hey, what you're doing right now is not healthy. Like sometimes healthy confrontate, you might not call him homie. You might be like, hey, John, like I noticed this is happening and this isn't healthy for our team and um, the health of our organization. So maybe you should change the way you're talking about such and such a person because that person's on our team and we love them. Right. Sometimes that kind of stuff is healthy. Second, write this down, a heart of humility. A great teammate is built on humility. A great team is built on humility. That's what 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 teaches us, that if we're going to be a great team, every single one of us has to cultivate a heart of humility to be able to say, 
I'm not perfect. I have weaknesses. I have strengths. I'm sorry. I messed up. Uh, I am seeking Jesus, being conformed to the image of Jesus. All of these are pictures of a heart of humility. Second, a heart of unity. Paul drives this home in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, how there was so much disunity in the Corinthian church because of competitive, individualistic mindsets. Uh, He's like, hey, that's not the way of Jesus. Unity is a way of Jesus. Togetherness around diversity is the way of Jesus. And if 2020 has shown us anything, it's that we're focused on things that create disunity instead of focusing on the things that create unity. And that's Jesus. And that's the person of Jesus, the mission of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, our our shared relationship around Jesus, the diversity that Jesus has uh, uh, built in this world. All of this is what we should focus on. Not the things that are disuniting, but the things that are uniting. Number three or four or whatever, I don't know. Number four, the motive to love people. In 1 Corinthians 13, he says, if you have the gift of oratory, if you have the gift of prophecy, if you have all of these amazing gifts, miracles, and you do all these amazing things and people are like, whoa, this is incredible, but you have not love, it means absolutely nothing. So it doesn't matter how good of a communicator you are, or how smart you are, or how you know, athletic you are, or you know, how good of a worship leader you are, whatever it is, if you aren't doing it out of love, if you're not saying, I'm using my gift to cause you to flourish as a follower of Jesus because I love you and care about you. It's not about me. I'm not, I'm not waiting for people to tell me how awesome and amazing I am. I'm doing it because I love you. That is the motive for serving God on a team. Number five, I don't know, what, where are we at? Number five, not only the motive to love people, but the motive to build people up. We want to cause every person to flourish, that's love, and we want to cause every person to grow, that's building one another up. That's what Paul says. You want want to be a great teammate? Here's your motive. Love people and build them up. See them cultivated, growing, flourishing as humans and followers of Jesus in the city where you've been planted. That's what it looks like to be a great teammate. And that's what it collectively looks like to be a great team. And then he adds one thing in here that I think is quite interesting. He really places emphasis on this in 1 Corinthians 14. Here it is. Order for the sake of edification. Paul's like, and if we're going to flourish when we gather and we meet, there has to be order, right? Some of us are like, God isn't a God of order. Like God just kind of does things, right? Kind of like me, shoot from the hip, do whatever, whatever I'm feeling in the moment. Actually, actually, that's okay if that's you, but God is a God of order. From the very beginning of creation, he spoke the world into existence and then he detailed forming the world that was order to gathering his people through Abraham and building a family and tribes, 12 tribes, and the way he placed them and the way he built the tabernacle and every detail and and the aesthetic of the tabernacle and then the temple, all of this God designed because God is a God of order. And so God basically says this, if there's going to be effectiveness, there has to be order. Right? It's like on a team, you've got a coach and then you have positions and then you have roles in that position. It's like, Order brings effectiveness. And so Paul emphasizes that as a major aspect of a healthy teammate and a healthy team. All right, that was just point number one. Are you ready for point number two? Here we go. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little faster through these. Number two, not only more than one all-star, but verses five through eight, more than one approach. I love this. Verses five through eight, check this out. He says in Acts chapter 18, let me get back there. Um, In verses five through eight, he says, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, so they were opposing Paul, they were saying mean things uh, toward him. He shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own hands. I am innocent from it. 
from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. This was an ancient way of saying, peace out. You don't like me? I'm out. Like ancient boundaries. He's like, okay, uh, you don't like me. You're becoming abusive in your speech. I'm going to shake off my clothes. And, and guess what Paul does? I love this. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of uh, another guy, uh, a worshiper of God, Crispus, the synagogue leader of that synagogue who was abusing Paul, the synagogue leader and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. This is like the best part of the story. Pa Paul's getting opposed. They're saying mean things against him. He's like ancient boundaries, peace out. And then he doesn't like go 10 miles down the road, he goes across the street. He says, hey, anybody who wants to follow me, leave the synagogue, come with me. We're gonna follow Jesus. And the leader of the synagogue says, I'm leading, leaving all of you guys. You don't have a teacher anymore. I'm following Paul and Jesus. It's like amazing. Can you imagine this? Like we have a church here and somebody leaves and like right across there on the lawn, they're like, we're starting a different church right over there. And if you wanna worship Jesus, come across the street. That's what it was like. And this is cool because Paul was preaching Jesus. The, be the people began opposing the message. And so he pivoted and went next door. And here's the thing. Paul was committed to the mission and refused to quit when he faced opposition. Like that's a good word. There's so much opposition in our life, in our culture in 2020. And even without the global pandemic, even without the events, being a follower of Jesus in a post-Christian society means we're all gonna face opposition. But if we're committed to the mission, no matter the opposition, we're gonna keep going with Jesus. And if you know anything about the early church, the early church experienced a lot of persecution for spreading the way of Jesus. There were many opponents. Christianity was not a legal religion in the Roman Empire. And so whatever they faced, they learned an important lesson. Persecution is not a dead end. Persecution is not a closed door. Persecution leads to new approaches. Persecution leads to new doors opening. When one door is closed, God opens another door. I want you to know that in your life. You're like, man, my, my friends, they're opposing me because now I'm, I'm beginning to follow Jesus. People that I love, my family members, they're making fun of me because I'm committing my life to following Jesus. I experienced this growing up. None of my family members were Christians when I came to believe in Jesus. And then I wanted to be a lawyer or a doctor and God was like, no, I want you to be a preacher. And I'm like, no, I don't wanna be a preacher. But eventually I listened to God and my family members were like, uh, you need a plan A, that's a plan Z, do something else, do that on the side. And I was like, no, I really feel like this is what I'm supposed to do in my life. And they opposed it. And I kept going on this mission because I knew that yes, if there's opposition, that doesn't mean every door is closed. If there's opposition, that doesn't mean that that's God. That just means there's opposition. And guess what? God kept opening doors and doors and doors. So persecution should never have the last word in our lives. God's word spreads despite the opposition. If there's an approach and you're like, I'm going to the synagogue and the synagogue says, I don't want you go across the street and say, I'm going to preach Jesus across the street. And everyone said, amen. I love what Jerome, an early church father said. He said, persecution has made the church of Christ grow. We would think the opposite, right? The church is stifled and stopped. No, persecution always caused the church to flourish. And I think this is really good for us. And so if somebody rejects us, if they say in the park next week, you gotta go somewhere else, we go somewhere else. They're not gonna tell us that, but you get it. We'll go somewhere else and we'll preach Jesus no matter what, because Jesus is the hope of this world. I'll say that again. Jesus is the hope of this world. Amen. Amen. Number three, last point, more than one attempt. Verses nine and 10, more than one attempt. What makes a team great? More than one attempt. What do you mean by that? Well, let me read verses nine and 10. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. 
Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. I want you to hear me on this. Sometimes opposition can lead to fear. And sometimes fear can lead to us choosing to suppress our own heart and gifts. You get what I mean by that? In other words, we so internalize this emotion of fear that it paralyzes us from expressing who God created us to be and it paralyzes us from us using our gifts effectively for Jesus on the team. That's what fear can do. And Paul's emotional state when he came to Corinth, you can write this down and read it later, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 5, Paul talks about going to Corinth. He actually says, when I went to Corinth, I was full of fear and trembling. We think of like Paul, like, oh no, he's strong and he's like, I'm all good and I don't have any fear. No, he was human. Humans have fear. He went to the city. He wasn't like, I'm the best guy in the block. I'm like the coolest dude around him, the smartest guy in the ancient world. He was like trembling in weakness and fear. First Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, because he was like, I, I can't do this on my own. And I know there's going to be opposition. I, I know the cultural layers of this city. This is going to be a hard work, a hard mission, but I'm going to go anyway, Lord. When he gets there, guess what? His fears became true. He faced all this opposition, all this persecution for the way of Jesus, for following Jesus. And God had a word for Paul. Listen to his word. He says, first, do not be afraid. Maybe that's a word for us in 2020 because fear can distort our perspective. Think about what we've lived through. Coronavirus, global pandemic, fires all around us, up and down the West Coast, social unrest around this entire country. Like this is a time where we can allow the emotion of fear, which is okay for a moment, begin to take hold and root in our lives and dominate us. And even in college, I think of, I remember being in college. When you get to college, you're like trying to fit in, trying to connect with people. And sometimes we have fear of people that we say, um, I don't really know how to express who I am anymore. We lose ourselves because we fear people. God wants you to know, do not fear. Do not fear who I've created you to be. Do not fear the, the complexities of 2020. Yes, they're real. Yes, we should have emotions, but don't allow those to dominate your life because fear can distort our perspective. And then he says the second thing, do not be silent. Why? Because fear can silence our voice. If the world needs a message in 2020, it's the message of Jesus. If the world needs hope, and it does in 2020, hope comes from Jesus. If the world needs clarity on how to live and how to navigate this moment in 2020, there's no greater clarity than the person of Jesus. If the world needs redemption in this moment to say, how are we gonna sort through this mess? How are we gonna get out of this mess in 2020? Redemption comes through Jesus. Amen. We cannot be silent because we have the message the world needs in 2020. If the world needs rest because everybody's full of unrest internally in 2020, we know Jesus has come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest for your souls. We cannot be silent in 2020. Amen, church? Amen. And notice what he says. He gives them assurance. He says, I am with you and I have many people in this city. No matter what you're feeling or experiencing, no matter the complexity of our situation, God wants to say to us today, I am with you. My presence is with you. I've empowered you for this mission. Don't distort your perspective. Don't silence your voice. I want to use your life in this city in this moment. And I have many people in this city. 
God has a work for us in 2020. God has a work for us in 2021. And God wants to use your life and my life and our lives as a team collectively to spread the mission and hope and love and message of Jesus in the city of Davis and beyond. And he says, keep going. Don't stop. Don't give up. Keep on mission. Keep seeking Jesus. Keep serving Jesus. Keep spreading the message of Jesus. Despite the opposition you face, you are the light of this city. You are the hope of this city. It is through Jesus that we are going to find hope and healing in 2020. And y'all are quiet, but my soul feels stirred up right now. We need this message. Listen to this, Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap if we do not give up. Sit in that for a moment. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap if we do not give up. I remember when I was 17 and I preached my first message at a Bible study in Southern Oregon on my high school campus. Not by choice, but by default, because everybody said, we're not gonna teach this Bible study. It was your idea, you teach it. I finished teaching the Bible study and it was awful. Like awful. I, I remember leaving and like, I'm just like, I can never do this again. I was sweating and stressed and my voice was fluttering and like, I have no cadence or rhythm or connection. And like, I'm like, this is awful, God. And I just felt that, like those emotions of like, I totally failed. And what is everybody gonna think about how bad this was? And then God's like, I want you to keep doing this. I want you to keep going. I want you to keep speaking. Don't be silent. I don't want you to be afraid. You're gonna get better at this, hopefully, and I'm still getting better all these years later. I want you to keep going. Do not let fear drive my calling and my mission for your life. And you know, I could have sat in those emotions and in that moment say, I quit, I give up, I'm gonna be silent. But instead, I kept listening to the voice of God and I kept going and I kept doing it. I kept getting a little better. You know, I'm just a little better than I was at 17, but I'm just getting a little better even in this moment. And I'm so glad because God opened so many doors because I listened to him because I kept going. I didn't let fear drive my life and I kept speaking for Jesus. That is a word for us in this moment. That is a word for your life in this moment. 2020 is gonna be a great year for Jesus, even with all the opposition we're facing, and a great year for our church, even though we faced multitudes of opposition. Let's put our eyes on Jesus and be a great team in 2020. God, we love you. Thank you that we can sit in the park and we can open up our hearts and our Bibles, and we just wanna center our hearts on Jesus right now. We wanna hear this word that Jesus, you gave to Paul, do not be silent, do not be afraid, for I am with you and I have many people in this city. In other words, there's all kinds of people that are gonna get saved in this city because of this team. And I pray that you would use us with humility, with a love for people, with a desire to see people built up, with a collective responsibility to be a healthy team, God, I pray that we would center our hearts on Jesus and that you would use our lives in 2020. God, use every person here. Speak courage, speak hope, speak life, speak calling into their lives. And may we do this together, not on our own. We love you. We worship you. I I pray for you. If you don't know Jesus today, Jesus Christ is the son of God the savior of the world. He left heaven 2000 years ago. He came to this earth. He lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death on a Roman cross to reconcile you back into a relationship with your creator God for all of eternity, to pay for all of your wanderings, all of your guilt, all of your wrongdoings on this earth, to forgive you, to wipe your slate clean, to give you hope, to express his love for you. And today all you have to do 
to begin to follow Jesus is say, I believe in Jesus. I receive him as my Lord and Savior. You can raise your hand. You can say this quietly or out loud. I believe in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe that I need a relationship with God. And through Jesus, that bridge is gapped. I am forgiven. I have a new life and a new hope in the person of Jesus. And today is the day. God, I begin to follow your son, Jesus Christ. For the rest of my life, in Jesus' name, let's worship together. truth with us this morning about God's incredible love. Would you sing this out? Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. So Coming after me 
There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down. You're coming after me, oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. And oh, it chases me down, fights still I found, leaves the night tonight. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. And still you give yourself away And all oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Whew. You guys give it up for the worship team, man and for, to Wesley for that incredible message. It's amazing what a community can do as a team united with the vision of Jesus. So we wanna give you a challenge this week as a part of our team. We want to leave this place and be unified in our communities. We want to invite our friends to church. We want to invite our roommates, invite our friends through Zoom. Even if we have to do it through Zoom, we can still invite people to be here and meet in person at church. So next week, don't forget that church starts an hour later. That's also an inviting point because you can even tell them, hey, you can sleep in for a little bit. Church starts at 10 a.m. next week. And if you're a college student, invite your friends. 9.30, we're hanging out right here. Love you guys.